Welcome to Calvary Episcopal Church in Columbia, Missouri. We're so glad you've joined us as we celebrate the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. This is a right one service of anti-communion, that is, everything that comes before communion in our usual Sunday service. We have a full service bulletin for you on our website, www.calvaryonninth.org, or you can follow along in the Book of Common Prayer. This service begins on page 323. Mm -hmm. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy holy name. Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to God on high and on earth peace, goodwill towards people. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee. We give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For if thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech thee, let thy continual pity cleanse and defend thy church, and because it cannot continue in safety without thy succor, preserve it evermore by thy help and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his sin. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 17, verses 1 to 7 and 16. Let us read it together in unison. Hear my prayer of innocence, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. Listen to my prayer, which does not come from lying lips. Let my vindication come forth from your presence. Let your eyes be fixed on justice. Weigh my heart. 
summon me by night, melt me down. You will find no impurity in me. I give no offense with my mouth as others do. I have heeded the words of your lips. My lips hold fast to the ways of your law. In your paths my feet shall not stumble. I call upon you, O Lord, for you will answer me. Incline your ear to me and hear my words. Show me your marvelous loving kindness, O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against them. But at my vindication, I shall see your face. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, beholding your likeness. Our second reading is from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from the Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. I'm very pleased today to welcome our friend and seminarian, Josh Huber, as our homilist. It's good to see you, Josh. Good morning, Calvary. It is good to join with you today from New Haven, Connecticut, as we enter this space of prayer and worship. Angel and I miss you all and hope to see you again soon, face to face. Yet, in these difficult times, it has been a great joy to watch from afar over these last months as Calvary continues to live as the people of God, adapting, serving, worshiping, praying, teaching, seeking God, doing good, confronting evil, and acting creatively through the power of Jesus Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I did not expect anything else, but oh, how good it is to see, if even from afar. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to you about both Jacob and Jesus. While our Genesis and Matthew readings seem very different this week, they are unified in detailing encounters with the divine set in liminal or transitional spaces, places of great stress, anxiety, 
and uncertainty. To begin with the Genesis reading, in the lead up to today's passage, we learn that Jacob, at God's urging, is traveling back to his homeland, the land promised to him by God. He has just found out that his brother Esau is coming out to meet him with 400 men. Jacob is greatly afraid and distressed by this news. Not only is this suspiciously more folks than you need in a welcoming party, but Jacob also did not leave his brother on good terms. If you recall Genesis 27, we are told that some 20 years before, Jacob stole Esau's blessing by deceiving his father Isaac. Then he had to flee to his uncle Laban's, from where he's now returning, because his brother Esau expressly wanted to kill him. Thus, in reaction to discovering Esau is coming in force to meet him, Jacob is understandably afraid. Yet, ever the go-getter, he reacts by dividing his party into two bands, thinking that if one is attacked and overcome, the other might just escape. He also sends a parade of gifts to his brother, hoping to pacify and appease him. And he prays. He thanks God for blessing him, begs God's protection from Esau, and reminds God of God's own promise to make Jacob's descendants as numerous as the sands of the sea. Then, having done all he could, in the middle of the night, Jacob gets up and sends his family ahead of him across the fords of the Jabbok, while he stays alone on the other side. And it is there, alone, awaiting a fraught meeting with his brother, that Jacob has this encounter with a strange man with whom he wrestles all night. Now you might notice in this story that in the midst of Jacob's fear and uncertainty, in this vital moment where Jacob isn't quite sure whether he will make it through the next day or not, God doesn't do one of those expected God things and give him advice or insurance or a new covenantal agreement. God doesn't even show up in some ambiguous, unambiguous and clarifying way. Instead, God appears, or at least Jacob thinks it is God, as a strange man who picks a fight, whoops Jacob so bad he leaves him limping, and then blesses the vanquished Jacob anyway with a new name. This all is exceedingly strange. This odd encounter, the great struggle, this transformation from Jacob to Israel, from a name that means the heel holder, or supplanter to one that means the God wrestler or God prevails. And what an ending. The sun rose upon him as he passed, Penuel, limping because of his hip. Now Penuel or Peniel are both from the same Hebrew root word and they mean the face of God or facing God. So if you sub in the translated name, verse 31 literally reads, The sun rose upon him as he passed the face of God, limping because of his hip. The sun rose upon him as he passed the face of God, limping because of his hip. To switch our focus now, I think Jacob's story is actually quite similar to what the disciples face in our gospel reading today. You see, in our gospel passage, Jesus and the disciples are supposed to be getting away to rest, to regroup, to grieve, and to plan for an uncertain and frightening future. Because they have just heard the devastating news that John the Baptist, that great prophet in the wilderness, and arguably the originator of Jesus' own movement, has been beheaded by Herod. They, like Jacob, just want some time alone to think and collect themselves before facing the difficult road ahead. Yet for them, it proves impossible to be alone. The crowds find Jesus out and come in droves. So when they arrive to the place they're going, their supposed hideaway, their longed for shelter, the disciples and Jesus find not the rest and reprieve, 
but the mass is waiting with all their demands and needs. Thus, instead of a much needed longed for rest and space to grieve, the disciples wrestle along Je alongside Jesus all day, working crowd control, perhaps even engaging in some subsidiary praying, teaching, and healing. So who can really blame them when after hours and hours of giving of themselves and ministering to others out of their exhaustion, grief, and fear, the exasperated disciples came to wisely advise Jesus that the crowd had better be getting on if they wanted to secure proper accommodations, and if he, Jesus, wanted to avoid a logistical nightmare, being trapped in the wilderness with several thousand isolated and probably hangry folks. Yet here, just as Jacob was transformed in Is to Israel in his wrestling with God, the disciples' fears, anxieties, and exasperations, and their logics of scarcity, are transformed into wonder and fullness in the presence of God's abundance as Jesus takes the common things they already had on hand, two fish and five loaves. Jesus blesses these ordinary elements, breaks them, and makes them into a meal more than enough for even the thousands gathered. Calvary Church, I don't mean to draw a simple comparison here to our time and place saying something like, see, God will meet all our needs and answer all our prayers and solve all our problems, just as he did for Jacob and the disciples. That isn't likely to happen. And it isn't what happens in our readings today either. Yes, Jacob has this marvelous encounter with God, is blessed by God, and receives a glorious new name. Yes, Jesus gives us a beautiful image of the abundance of God's grace and provision out of the commonplace in the kingdom of heaven. But there is still Esau to meet. Jacob is still a wanderer, and now one with a limp, living outside the promised land. John is still dead. Jesus and his disciples' lives are still very much at risk. And many, if not most, of the individuals sitting on the grass, enjoying bread and fish, would still wake up the next morning hungry, oppressed by an occupying nation, and full of fear, with little hope of life being materially improved any time in the near future. So no, these are not stories about God fixing everything if we just have enough faith. Rather, these are stories about a God who draws abundance out of our common experience, who is enough and more than enough, not because we are removed from the struggle, but because God in Jesus is with us in that struggle, in our lives, moment to moment, day by day, more abiding than our hunger and basic needs, sustaining through every hardship as we, like Jacob, renamed Israel, and the disciples reframed to find wonder and life in the everyday, are transformed inter by act interacting with God in our lives and in each other. Church, this is an election year. This is a time of protest and social upheaval and cries for justice. This is a moment and a long one, and a long awaited one, of reckoning with our past sins and inadequacies collectively and as individuals. This is a time of deep anxiety and fear and conflict over just how to address that fear and anxiety. This is a time of pandemic and death and grief and mourning. None of us are likely to make it through this without failing one another, ourselves, and God. None of us. None of us are likely to fully avoid the dehumanizing impulse that makes a monster an object of the other, whoever that other might be for us. None of us. None of us are likely to come through this unscathed or unchanged. None of us. And yet none of us, no, not one, are beyond the love, abundance, ineffable care, deep concern, transformative power, 
and marvelous presence of our God as exemplified in Christ Jesus, our Lord. None of us. So all of us may partake of this amazing grace, for this is the gospel. This, this love is the reason why, in spite of how we will struggle, how we are struggling, how we have struggled, in all senses of the word. God moves, God loves, and God wills good in and through and to us, not outside the struggle and mess and chaos and pain and fear and sorrow of our lives, but in the very midst of them. Thus, no matter our times and their hardship, no matter all the ways we have not yet arrived, no matter our inabilities and failings, we might proclaim together with all God's people and every time and place the words of the prophet Isaiah found in our own book of common prayer. Cry aloud, ring out your joy, for the great one in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Amen. We continue by saying together the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he has worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all humans, receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal, universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Dean, Dion, Bishop of Missouri, Valerie, our interim rector, Janet, our deacon, Mo, our pastoral visitor, and Josh, our seminarian, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Donald, our president, and Mike, our governor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. 
Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those on our parish prayer list and all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with thy spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of God's peace. And now our vestry person, John Smith, will offer the announcements for the week at Calvary. Hello, everyone. Today is Food Bank Sunday. So traditionally, of course, Calvary takes up a special donation to send to the Central Missouri Food Bank. But you can give any time during the month, either online or by a check made out to Calvary Episcopal Church. Just put Food Bank in the memo line. This ministry has become more important than ever due to the pandemic and job losses. So please help support this vital mission. Speaking of donations, have you ever used the donate button on the Calvary website? It is a really easy and safe way to continue your regular donations or make a special donation to Calvary while the building is closed and we can't worship in person together. To begin, just click on the green donate button on the upper right side of the Calvary website. You'll be directed to a page where you fill in the specifics about your donation. After completing that, you click Donate at the bottom left corner, which will direct you to PayPal. That's a very secure method for making financial transactions over the internet. You just fill in your credit card information and follow the simple instructions to complete your donation. You'll get a receipt almost immediately from Connie, who must be working overtime to make all this happen, and then you're done. So no matter how much of a technophobe you might think you are, I'm sure you can do it. Uh, we have news from the Saturday Cafe. A big thanks to everyone who helped out with the cafe on Saturday, July 25th. They provided a delicious home-cooked meal to 26 very appreciative guests. If you're interested in vol volunteering on a future Saturday, uh, you need to use the link in Calvary News to sign up. Please note that anyone who plans to work at the church must sign up in advance so we do not exceed our building's occupancy limits. If you have any questions, or if you'd like to be added to the Saturday Cafe email list, please contact Gretchen Roars. Calvary's Blessing Box is empty every morning, 
So everything that is being donated is being used by a variety of people without stable housing. Thank you to everyone who's contributed to this wonderful ongoing ministry. And finally, a note on building use at Calvary. The Calvary Episcopal Church building is officially closed, but a few vital functions are still being performed in the building. If you need to be in the building, please wear a mask, and there are extras in the office if uh, you don't have one of your own. Maintain a six-foot distance from other people, wash your hands frequently, and let the church office know when and where you plan to work in the building so the sexton can clean the areas you were in after you have completed your work. It is absolutely essential that the building be cleaned after each activity. This prevents disease transmission within the church. The church is keeping a list of dates, names, and emails of everyone who comes in the church, just in case we should ever need it for a contact investigation. Please sign in at the office or the back door whenever you enter the church. That will help keep you and everyone else safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We'll continue now with the prayer our Savior taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.